Last time we added a really smooth moving camera that follows this cube around everywhere it goes, but there are still a lot of missing pieces in this project. Today we're going to tackle colliding with obstacles, so let's get right into it. In the last video, we added a few walls here at the end just so we could visualize how we bump into things and keep going afterwards. Well, we don't want this to happen. To fix this, we need to check when this cube is hitting something, specifically an obstacle. So there are a few things that have to happen here, and the first thing we're going to do is open up our player, and there are multiple ways to check if our object is being hit. And the first way is just to come down here into our graph, right click, and look for event hit. We have a collision event here for event hit. Whenever anything in this actor that has collision hits something, it will run this event. But this works for every object within this actor that has collision. So if we had another cube and it were over here, if this cube hit anything, it would detect that hit as well. And we don't want to do that. Right now, it would be totally fine to use this event hit, but we're going to use something a little bit more specific, which is a component event hit. We can come over here and select our static mesh component, right click, add event, add on component hit. And this creates the exact same event, but specific to when this component hits something. No matter if we had another cube in here or not, we're only ever detecting if this static mesh component here hits something. But right now, it's not going to do anything, and we can print a string to see if it's detecting anything that we hit. If we compile this and close this, we're never detecting that we're hitting anything. And the reason for that is a sneaky little checkbox that always messes with me still to this day. We have to come over here to our static mesh component over here to collision and make sure that simulation generates hit events is true. If this is false, it will never run this event. But as long as we are generating hit events, whenever we hit something, this event will be called. So now, without changing any code here, we can just hit play and it's always giving us a message until we fly off the edge. Then the messages will stop being displayed. So why is it doing that? We only want to detect these walls. Well, technically, we are always hitting something because our player is sliding along the ground. So it's also detecting that we're hitting the ground here. And there are multiple different ways that we could check if it hits an obstacle or not. And the first way would be tags. So we can click on this wall here. Over here in the details panel, search for tag. We have component tags and actor tags. I'm just going to add an actor tag here and name this obstacle. We're going to do the same thing to this cube and same to the third cube over there. Well, now if we run into it, it's still not going to do anything different than what we were doing before, because now we have to check if our cube is hitting the specific walls that have the obstacle obstacle tags. To do this, let's go back into our character here. We need to understand what this event hit is returning. It's telling us what object inflicted the hit. This will always return itself, whatever's in this parentheses here. The other actor is the actor that we're hitting, and the component is the component specifically that we're hitting. We also have a normal impulse and an entire hit structure here, which if we break this, you'll see that there's a lot of other information here that we don't need quite yet, so we're not going to bother with that. All we care about right now is this other actor. We're going to pull off of this other actor here and we're going to look for has tag and we're going to check if the actor has a specific tag and the tags name is obstacle. We can hold B and left click to create a branch. Just connect the execution pin up to the branch here and make sure that our return value is our condition here because we want to check if the actor that we hit has the obstacle tag and if it does then we will print a string saying we hit an obstacle and if we don't hit something that has the tag obstacle we won't do anything. We can compile this, close this and test this this out. And as soon as we hit a wall, it tells us that we have hit an obstacle. And this is one way to do it. But that means that every time you add a new obstacle into your scene, you're going to have to add a tag to it. So I'm actually going to remove all of these tags here on each of these. And instead, we're going to rename these cubes to obstacle. This will be obstacle two. This will be obstacle three. And now another way we can do this is going back into our player here. And instead of checking for a tag, we can then get the name of the actor we hit, get display name. We can get rid of this check here just to see what this is doing. And we can play plug this return value string into the string that we are printing to the screen. And if we play this, we can see it's telling us what we're hitting. We're hitting the ground, we're hitting the ground and an obstacle, or we're hitting nothing at all. So what we can do with this is instead of just printing it immediately, we can bring back our branch by holding B and left clicking, connecting the execution pin back up, and then checking if this display name is equal by pressing equal twice, equal string. Is this display name equal to obstacle? And if it is, then we will print string saying we hit an obstacle. Compile that that, close this, 
this and play. And if we hit this one, we hit an obstacle. But the problem is if we hit this one, it's not telling us anything. And that's because the name isn't equal to obstacle. The first one is, but the second one's name is obstacle two. Sure, we could just, if that's not true, run another check to see if it's equal to obstacle two, but that's even more complicated than just adding tags. What we could do instead is just check if this display name contains under string here, the name obstacle. We're not going to bother with case sensitive or searching from the end. We just want to check if this display name has obstacle in it anywhere. And then if it does, then we'll print string, which will work the exact same way that tags did, because no matter what, it does have obstacle in the name. But this is also kind of unnecessary. All of these different options would work, but I think the best way to do this is by creating an obstacle blueprint. We're actually going to remove all three of these obstacles here and just bring in a new cube. As you can see, it's kind of hard to tell apart from the environment just like our original player cube was. So we're going to create a material for this. Come down here to the content browser, right click, add a material. This will be M underscore obstacle. We can double click this and this will show us a different way of creating a material. Last time we held four and left click or right clicked and typed constant four vector and we, we can get the same thing. But this time we're actually going to do that with three values instead of four. So you can hold three on the keyboard and left click or look for constant three vector. So these three values are just RGB, red, green, and blue. But in the constant four vector, we have four values, which is RGBA. It'll be red, green, blue, and alpha. Well, our alpha value is actually opacity. And we don't need opacity because we're creating some solid objects here. A vector four works just fine, but we can work with a vector three the exact same way. I'm going to give this a slight gray color. We can plug this into our base color here, apply it. Now we can just save this, close this material, and apply the material to the cube in our scene. And there we go. That looks nice. Much easier to tell apart from the rest. But when we bump into it, it's still not doing anything. And now we could just name this to obstacle in our scene or give it a tag or something. But instead, we're going to turn this into a blueprint. I'm going to come over here to blueprint slash add script and name this BP underscore obstacle. It's going to be a new subclass. The static mesh actor will be its parent. And there we go. It creates our blueprint here. Now we don't need to actually do anything in here. But the reason I wanted to turn this into a blueprint is we can now do all kinds of things in here. If we wanted to, we could make this move around. We could give it different types. We could make it transform into different things if we wanted to. We can do anything we want with this blueprint now. We're going to leave it as is for now, but that allows other options later. And it also allows us a new way to check if we hit an obstacle. So we can go back into our player now and we're going to remove this check right here entirely. And instead, we're going to cast to the obstacle. So the other actor here is the actor that we actually hit. So we're going to check if this actor that we hit is equal to an obstacle. Well, we could technically get the class of this actor that we hit and check if the class is equal to the obstacle blueprint that we just created and use this branch to check if this obstacle that we hit is the same class as an obstacle class. Plug this in and this will do exactly what we want it to do, but it's not exactly the smartest way to do it because then we wouldn't be able to get any of this actor's information. If we hit this actor, say we wanted to run a function specific to this obstacle that we hit. Well, right now we can't get any variables or functions or anything from this specific obstacle blueprint. So to do this, we would cast to it instead. So we can cast to blueprint obstacle. And there it is. We have an execution pin, but it also has an object input argument, which is a wild card. And that's because we can try to cast to an obstacle from anything. But what we're going to check is if this actor that we hit is of class obstacle. That's what this cast is doing is it's basically running a check. And if it's true, we can get information from it. And obviously if, if it fails to cast to it, it's just like a branch false value because we didn't actually successfully get it. So then we can plug this execution pin here into print string and it's going to do the exact same thing that happened in every other situation so far. If we run into it, we hit an obstacle. And there we go. Now, if we had a function specific to this obstacle that we wanted to run when we hit it, we could then run it off of this. Or if we wanted to change a variable once we hit this obstacle, we could do that as well. We don't need to do any of that though. We just wanted to print string to let us know that we did. Now that we know that we've hit an obstacle, we want to stop the player's movement immediately because once we hit an obstacle, we want that to restart the level. We're going to use a sneaky little trick of using a Boolean check at both of these events to make this happen. First, we're going to come over here to the left at variables and add a can move Boolean variable. We're going to make sure this is a Boolean. We're going to compile this and we're going to set this to true by default. Make sure this is checked. Otherwise, when you play, you will not be able to move by default. Obviously, it's not going to do anything just yet because we haven't accessed the variable at all. We're going to replace this print string down here after we hit an obstacle with the can move variable. So just go ahead and drag your can move 
variable in here, hold alt and drop it onto the graph to set it. And we're going to, whenever we hit an obstacle, tell us that this can move variable is false. It's still not checking if we can move or not. So whether this value is true or false doesn't mean anything yet. We have to ask on event tick and on event move sideways if we can move before we actually do it. Because right now, it doesn't matter if we can move or not, it's going to be adding a forward force. And if we press a button, it doesn't matter if we can move or not, we're going to do it anyways. So to do this off of this sequence here, we're just going to hold B and left click to create a branch, drag off of the then zero into this execution pin here, and we're going to bring in our can move boolean. And we can just hold control to get this and plug this into our condition. So now whatever this can move value is, is what we'll be checking before we add force. So if we can move, then we will be adding force in the forward direction. And if we can't, we're not going to be doing anything, no matter how many times this ticks. And then we're going to do the exact same thing down here at the input axis move sideways event. So we can just take this branch with the can move check. We're going to copy that. We're going to bring that down here and we're going to plug this execution pin into the branch, move this over a little bit to tidy it up. And if we can move, then whenever we press this button, we will add force. But if we can't, no matter how many times we press this button, we will not do anything. And there we go. Now, if we compile and we close this blueprint, if we bump into it, we now can't move anymore. I'm pressing buttons. We're not moving forward. We're not moving sideways sideways, we've completely stopped movement. And I can add as many of these obstacles into my scene as I would like. I can drag them in from the content browser. I can hold alt to duplicate them and move them around the scene. I can scale them up and stretch them if I wanted to, to just mess with the level design. I can do whatever I want here, but as soon as we bump into them, we stop all movement. Obviously, when we bump into these things, we don't restart the level yet, and falling off the level, we still just kind of fall infinitely, but that's enough for its own video. So there we go. Now you can just play around, place these objects in the scene wherever you'd like and just have a little fun with it. You can make as many levels as you'd like to try to play through and see if you can get to the end of your own levels, even though you do have to exit and start again every time. But it's still something fun to play around with for now. In the next video, we're going to focus on gameplay and kind of setting up some levels, making the scene look a little bit nicer and adjusting the player movement to get it to feel a little bit better before we actually worry about adding some game over functionality and a win state. But don't worry, we'll get there soon enough. Once again, thank you guys so much for the incredible support you've given me throughout this series, and I hope to see you in the next video.